Hello everyone, this is Space Cafe Podcast, and I'm Marcus. Today we dive into the third installment of our mini-series on the groundbreaking NASA ESA planetary defense mission. The mission's goal, to deflect Dimorphos, the moonlet of the asteroid Didymos way out there between Mars and Jupiter. Over the last two episodes, we've seen how spectacular this mission is, both in concept and execution. October 2024 will mark the launch of ESA's Hera spacecraft, accompanied by the CubeSats Milani and Juventus, as they embark on a journey to unravel the mysteries left behind by NASA's DART spacecraft's collision with the asteroid. In today's episode, I'm excited to welcome planetary scientist Andy Rifkin, the lead investigator for NASA's DART mission. Our conversation took place at ESA's ESTEC testing site during one of the final meetings of the Global Asteroid Excellence ahead of Hera's launch next year. And Andy, having done his job, was particularly relaxed. And he shares insights from his perspective amidst the buzzing preparations for the Hera mission. And as a special treat, we'll get to hear a bit of Andy's singing talent. You'll also notice some background chatter. I chose to keep it unedited. You're essentially eavesdropping on a gathering of some of the world's foremost asteroid researchers. Andy stepped out of this meeting to chat with me with the doors wide open due to security protocol. So let me take you on this journey just as I experienced it. Let's go. How are you? Is this your first time here at Aztec? Uh, it is my second time at Aztec. I um, don't remember exactly when the first time was. It, I think it was less than 10 years ago, but more than five. <laughs> the building still, still looks the same. Yeah, although there's a lot of uh, construction out there. Yeah. Do you know what they're building, in fact? I have no idea. Maybe a car park. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Tell me everything about DART. That Ev everything. Everything. And we're, we, no, no. Tell me that sister mission to Issa's Hera mission. Um, that's such a also dramatic mission on a symbolic level because you're working on something. You're maybe getting attached to something, mm. a piece of machinery, and then you're intentionally destroying it, slamming it into something. This is also maybe not the usual thing to do uh, with spacecraft. Yeah, yeah, it's been, um, you know, interesting. We've known, of course, all along from, from when we started conceiving of this, started trying to convince people that this was uh, something we should be doing now. Um, you know, I have a lot of colleagues that work on other missions. They work on Mars rovers. They work on, you know, the the Galileo or Cassini missions and those go on, you know, those missions go on for years and years and years. And at the very end, you know, the rover gets stuck in the sand or they decide that, okay, the end of Cassini has to be, they dunk it into the atmosphere of Saturn and everyone's very sad. And, um, and so we knew ahead of time, of course, that, that how DART was going to end and tried to make sure to uh, not, you know, to treat it as, uh, maybe not to be detached exactly, mm. but to say, okay, look, the experiment, this is the point of this is, mm. is the experiment. The experiment requires the spacecraft to be slammed. To into, die. To, to, yeah. Well, to, <laughs> we tried to even not anthropomorph anthropomorphize it, you know, yeah. when we were doing um, educational things, when we were doing outreach things um, again, you know, Rosetta and, mm. and Philae, and there was the anthropomorphized, you know, uh, lander, and then it, it ended up, you know, freezing to death in the dark. And we didn't want to traumatize a generation of, <laughs> you know, of 10 year olds. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we tried very hard to, uh, to make it clear, you know, just like people, you know, if you're building a house, you know, you go through a lot of nails, you go through a lot of screws and the nails and screws never get used again, but they're part of, part of building, building a bigger something. Picture. Yeah. So, um, I think we, as a team, uh, did pretty well and we tried to recognize dart was you know dart is not just the equipment dart is the people uh the the scientists and the engineers and the managers and the 
you know, the admin people, all, all the people that did all the work and that are going to continue to do the work. That's, that's Dart, you know, as much as or more than the, the hardware. So in a nutshell, what to all those listeners who may not be familiar with Dart, in a nutshell, mm. what was the mission all about? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, jumped right in. Uh, Dart no, is, I asked. Uh, <laughs> I asked. I forced you to jump right into it. I'm sorry for that. No, no. Uh, Dart is uh, an acronym. It stands for the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Uh, Finally an acronym. Yes. Um, it was a mission uh, that uh, is, uh, was designed to be a planetary defense test. Uh, so we took an, uh, a spacecraft and we uh, slammed it into an asteroid. Uh, actually, it was the moon of an asteroid. And we did that to change the path of that asteroid's moon. It's called Dimorphos. Um, and to, to show that we could change the orbit of an object in space, of a natural object in space, mm -hmm. that we had the expertise to intercept something small and, and change its orbit. The idea is that if we were ever faced with an asteroid that was coming in to hit the Earth uh, and we needed to change its orbit, uh, that we could do so without resorting to something, you know, like what you would see in the movies, not resorting to a nuclear... Mm, a Bruce nuclear, Willis type. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Solutions. Exactly. Uh, that you could, you could do it, you know, uh, just kinetically. You could mm. do it just by slamming a piece of, piece of hardware into, mm. uh, into the asteroid. What was your role in all of this? I um, have been the investigation team lead for DART. So uh, because DART is not a, a more typical science mission, um, typically at least in the US, and, and I, I'm sure in Europe and elsewhere, you know, the idea that scientists have an idea. They say, we want to measure the, uh, the temperature of the atmosphere of Jupiter. We want to measure the geology on Venus. And then they develop their their science goals. They put together a team of scientists, and they and they um, they carry that out. Um, Dart as a planetary defense mission, um, technically uh, it was it was handled a different and from a different part of NASA than the science missions. Mm -hmm. So we did not have a science team uh, because we were not a science mission. We had an investigation team who were composed of scientists. Um, so on other missions, what I did would be considered the, the kind of one of the, the science team leads. So making sure that the data we took um, and the, the timeline for analyzing that data and for uh, getting, getting the results out to the public, that all of that was done um, consistent with what we told NASA we were going to do and consistent with the goals mm. of the mission. Mm. Um, yeah, making making sure that that we we did what we said we were going to do in the way we said we were going to do it, and we had all the observations lined up to do it. So um, the whole slamming into the asteroid moon happened. The spacecraft has evaporated. Has the moon been deflected? And if it were on a real course to Earth, would it, would it have deflected it so as to not hit Earth? Um. So trying to take that in, in order, um, and, and remind me if I don't. So yes, DART uh, launched in November 2021, less than two years ago, which is crazy. It feels like a lot has happened uh, since then. Um, and impacted Dimorphos uh, in late September. I think it was September 26th, 2022, just a little over a year ago at, at, at this moment. Um, we did change the orbit period of Dimorphos around Didymos. It had been 11 hours and 55 minutes uh, prior to Dart's arrival, and now it's 11 hours and 32 minutes, I think. Um, we changed the speed of um, the speed of Dimorphos by something like two and a half to three millimeters per second, which doesn't sound like a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, but, but it is, it, it, it adds up. And that is kind of the key to that last question of yours. Um, would we have had enough time to deflect it if it were incoming to Earth? And the answer to that is entirely depends on how much time we had. Right, and how far and away it how, is. Yeah, how much warning time. So yeah. um, if if we literally were just using DART and it was literally Dimorphos incoming, then I think we would have needed something like, uh, I forget offhand, something like 40 to 60 years. Um, but... Um, 
if we, you know, Dart is is not the largest thing that we could have done. Uh, we we needn't have only sent one if it were a real emergency. Uh, and so this was really intended to um, demonstrate uh, the proof of concept. Uh, and because um, we were not deflecting Dart in a from an Earth, you know, Earth impacting orbit but instead just trying to to move it in its in its little orbit around its its parent body um dart was able to to do the job um that we that we designed okay. it for for the okay. experiment okay um andy people love background stories and making off stories so why don't you share a bunch of insights people may not know about the dart mission that could be inspiring to our audiences or Maybe not only inspiring, but revealing of something. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. So it's a, um, m it, it might not be recognized that there are lots and lots and lots of great ideas for space missions, and the vast majority of them never get, um, never get anywhere. Mm. And it's hard to tell <laughs> early on uh, which ones are, are in which category. And sometimes, um, you know, sometimes you're sitting around with your friend and, and you come up with what you think is a great idea and you, you know, pull out the napkin and, and 10 <laughs> minutes later you say, oh, this isn't going to work. But sometimes you go, oh, this will work. And then, um, you know, you convince some more people and you convince, you know, your institution that, hey, you know, let's let's get, you know. Let's get some support. Let's get some engineers together and let's take a few days. Mm. And sometimes at that point, oh, okay, this isn't going to work, but it does. And it, but some, some, uh, ideas go on for years before finally reaching some point, uh, at which, you know, some larger group of experts say, okay, here's what you didn't think about. Here's the nuance why this isn't going to work. Or you go to your space agency and they say, oh, this would work. We just would rather do something else because we don't have, you know, a whole lot of funds. So Dart had to go through a whole lot of um, uncertainty years mm -hmm. and years. And, um, you know, uh, you want to uh, you want to give your heart to the things you work in, on. Uh, you know, you want to throw yourself in and go, OK, I'm I'm, I'm in. committed. But um, but that was, you know. Uh, I started working on Dart, uh, and I, I wasn't one of the um, Andy Cheng, who works at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab with me, is the one whose whose brainchild this was. Um, and I didn't join until a few years later. Um, and even even with that, it was close to ten years ago that I that I started mm. working on it. And it wasn't until maybe six or seven years in that it was it was definitely okay. We're going to do this. So it's a lot of time where you're kind of hedging and thinking, okay, I'm going to, uh, you know, I think this is a great idea, but I don't want to have my heart broken mm. um, because at the same time as Dart is making its way successfully forward, you know, there are other things sure. that you're also working on that, that aren't going to make their way mm. forward. Um, so, um, so that means you have like multiple projects in parallel and one will make it and the rest won't make it. Often, often, yeah, and um, it's I, I I've been a I, I've been a, a you know a planetary scientist my whole career, so I can't really compare. But you know, I, I imagine that it it might be like what people who are freelance writers or yeah, or you know where where you've got a whole bunch of you know novel ideas. Same happens to me, filmmaker. Filmmaker, You're, sure. It's sometimes the the process before producing a film is the most frustrating one. Um, I used to be <clears throat> part of a development uh, lab, development department in a company. And this is where you develop ideas, 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 and you pitch them. And, and you're never getting anywhere. So this is usually how it works. So it's very frustrating. You're developing for the dustbin. Yeah, and, yeah. and then you have like, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 pitches, and one will make it. And yeah. this will pay for everything else. So, yeah, yeah. But it's the frust... So, uh, I think I think you're in the same. We're in the same boat. Yeah, here. yeah. Um, it's also um, it's also uh, funny to me um, when I was uh, in high school. You know, when I was a kid, um, I had a lot of friends who were like, "I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to do all this stuff." And uh, I thought, "Wow, you know, that's that sounds like 
you know, if you're a doctor or you're a lawyer and you have you have a one bad day or you have whatever, you could like really ruin <laughs> someone's life. That's like bad. That's that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. I'm going to be an astronomer because that's yeah. what could you possibly mm -hmm. screw up if you're an mm -hmm. astronomer? And now ironically, right, um, you know, uh, the the odds are good that uh, that planetary defense is, uh, you know, this is really just an insurance policy. Yeah. Um, but uh, it is it is. Funny to me that, uh, you know, going from like, oh, my God, I don't want to. What if I screw up extracting mm. this tooth and someone's in mm. pain? That, that'd be awful to like, oh, we're going to, you know, deflect this asteroid. And <laughs> or sleeping know. while brain surgery. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Wow. No, no, thanks. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, getting older, uh, it, it is um, gratifying to see the way that yeah. that uh, planetary defense and DART have connected with with people um that people really do um i think understand you know um that uh, this is something that that is worth looking at um you know it's not it's not something that should keep people up at night um uh, worrying about it um because we are doing you know the the what we should do as a as a society to say okay here's here's a potential danger we're going to understand here's that solution. danger yeah here's a solution we're gonna just understand the situation and um and then handle it so yeah that is it is uh hopefully we are helping people sleep better at night. yeah how far from establishing a full functioning sky dome <laughs> um how far from from having something in place like this are we um i think it is um on the, the the statistics would suggest that something like that is un, unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is uh, going to be a, a linear a linear podcast. So to it speak. is okay. Yeah. So so going back to uh, you know how long uh, would it take Dart to you know yeah. uh, and and I said well it's fifty or sixty years or so part of you know what planetary the the next high priority thing in planetary defense is getting the space telescopes in place um, so that we can do the search so that we can either say, oh, yeah, there is something, but it is 80 years out, so we've got the time to handle it, or um, hopefully, oh, yeah, okay, we're clear for the next 200 years, we're clear for the next 300 years. Um, and I think um, we're kind of at the place now where uh, looking at the numbers – Statistically speaking, we do not expect to have something, you know, that we really need to worry about anytime, you know, soon. But until we actually look, mm. we don't know, mm. um, you know, which is why we're, we're developing things like DART um, to be, you know, just in case. Um, and you know you can you can go into the casino and think okay well, the odds that I hit on this next roulette you know roll are are slim but sometimes you do um, and sometimes you go hours and hours and and you don't so um, until we actually do a, a a real comprehensive search for what's out there um, there there is a chance mm -hmm. no matter no matter what the odds say um, so I think uh, in terms of uh, having something kind of on call, uh, that is still, uh, an ongoing subject of discussion in the, mm. in the community. You know, um, you, you might imagine that if, um, you know, in the, in the 1970s, say mm. if, if they said, oh, we're going to put up a whole bunch of satellites and we're going to not worry about this. So if we ever find something, we'll be okay. And, and if we did find something now, we might say, well, that was very nice of them in the 1970s to put up a bunch of satellites, but we'll we'll take it from here. <laughs> so um, similarly, given how fast technology moves, especially in space, uh, whether whether pre-positioning something with 2020s technology or 2030s technology would do any good in a hypothetical threat in 2080 or 2090, um, it's it's not it's not clear which which way that balance would go. Mm. So I guess the the lower hanging fruit uh, when it comes to understanding asteroids is mining asteroids. So this is maybe also a takeaway from those missions, from the Hera mission, from the DART mission, to understand what those rubble piles are built up of. If there is a core, 
blah, blah, blah. So is this something in reach, coming ever closer in reach that we are venturing out to mine those places? Yeah, um, asteroids are, I mean, I, 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 asteroids are great. <laughs> They're really under, underrated uh, celestial objects, in my opinion, because there is, um, you know, scientifically, they're fascinating. Uh, they're these remnants from solar system formation. Uh, they, they maintain, uh, you know, evidence and, and, and uh, things we can study from literally the beginning of the solar system. They are uh, these potential hazards, which is where mm. we're, what, you know, the meeting we're at here is, is, is dealing with Hera. Uh, to, which is a follow-up to, to DART and, and looking more at the, at the science and the planetary defense. Um, and then they are these potential ways in which, you know, human, the, the economy of Earth is going to move right. out. Um, but, and, and they all um, are related to one another. You know, DART um, was the first, was, was certainly the most... Uh, energetic interaction with an asteroid mm -hmm. surface we've had. Um, and, uh, you know, and things like uh, Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2 and Osiris-Rex also interacted with, a, with an asteroid surface. And that's of great interest to people who want to mine it because they want to know, you but know, it's made if, up if of. you start, well, not only that, yeah. but if you start digging at it, if you, you know, can you anchor in it? Mm. Can you, yeah. if you, if you land something and push on it, you know, yeah. uh, are you going to just topple over? Yeah. Or are you going to really anchor? So um, we're getting fundamentally important um, information for, for people who want to mine. Um, I think um, the, I think technically we're, we're very close to having the technology we would need. Um, maybe not on a huge scale, but on a, on a little scale, at least to again, demonstrate that, that it's doable. Um, the business case I think is always the toughest thing that, that, uh, to, to figure out, there was the um, kind of a, a, a group of companies that formed last decade um, that thought it was it was time, mm. um, but they they couldn't quite make the business model work. Um, and I think uh, you know the, the the classic idea of we're going to mine, you know, platinum and 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 all this stuff. Uh, is not where those companies thought the business case was. Mm. Um, they were looking at using at mining asteroids and then using the material in space mm. um, to, for instance, produce uh, fuel. To be, yes, exactly to to produce fuel to re refuel uh, communication satellites. So you can make right now communication satellites are the lifetime is limited by the amount of fuel they have. So if you can refuel them, you can make them bigger and longer, you know, more capable because they're going to last for, you know, 20 years instead of five or whatever mm -hmm. the numbers are. Um, so if that business case uh, could be made, if you ended up had investors who were willing to wait a while before getting a return, um, whether those are, you know, rich uh, entrepreneurs or whether they are nation states that mm -hmm. have decided that strategically they want to do that, I, I don't know. Um, one big, uh, thing that I think we need to think about, um, and that I, I think is very important is kind of the ethics of what we're doing because we, we have not started mining asteroids yet. Um, and I think it would be a, uh, a real tragedy if, um, and obviously I'm speaking for myself here mm -hmm. potentially, uh, I think it would be a real tragedy if all of the wealth that is out there or that is purported to be out there just ended up making a small number of already wealthy people more wealthy, wealthy yeah. instead of really being able to to say, well, we we're going to do this for the benefit of all all of humanity. Uh, you know, use use this wealth, use this this bounty to kind of improve things for everybody. I, I think that would that would be better. And um, the laws uh, you know, international law hasn't quite gotten there. And, and, um, I think individual countries are, are interpreting the existing law in, in ways that may or may not be consistent with that kind of vision of the future. So I, I do, um, hope that, that now while we're still have time to 
you know, set that kind of ethical framework in, in place that we that we do so. Like the, the current framework, would it allow mining for if you came up with a technology and a business case, could you do it and not ask anyone? Um, the, the, my, I, I am not a lawyer. I guess I'll <laughs> say the, the classic internet phrase. I am not a lawyer and I am certainly not your lawyer. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, as I understand it, the international law is that nations cannot claim territory. So, you know, the, the U S flag at the Apollo sites was not, you know, this is, a, this is belongs to America now. Um, but, um, nations can, um, can extract resources mm -hmm. and they can do that without, um, without putting a claim in. You cannot, um, interfere with other, uh, facilities that are extracting mm -hmm. resources. And apparently, um, again, as I understand it with that, I'm not claiming, you know, uh, even something like the lunar samples brought back by Apollo or the, the samples of Ryugu brought back by Hayabusa 2, those are resources. Um, they aren't necessarily ores, uh, but, um, so, um, and then a, a company is, um, you know, bound by international law. Uh, and the nation in which they are operating or the nation in which they are headquartered is responsible for their behavior. Mm. So even if a hypothetical uh, company had had capability to launch into deep space, um, you know, and decided they were going to deflect an asteroid, say, mm -hmm. um, you know, that the, the country from which they launched um and, and, or the country in which they're headquartered would be responsible for, uh, for their behavior and either for stopping them from doing something. Cause you could even use that as a weapon. So Americans could deflect an asteroid to hit a, a different country. Well, um, okay. Maybe so, this is going too far now. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, I, I think, um, or Austrians or Austrians. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think that in practice i mean i know it's another uh famous sci-fi trope but um i think that it would really be kind of a show-offy james bond <laughs> yeah totally. like completely impractical if you really wanted to wreak havoc yeah. on on another country use conventional nukes nukes yeah you would yeah. not go launch a, a rocket and have people go i wonder where that rocket's going and then yeah. do something to an asteroid yeah. and then having all the telescopes in the world going like oh that asteroid is now <laughs> going to hit the earth in yeah. 30 years yeah, yeah. and then give other people time to deflect it. And then you still have to find an asteroid mm -hmm. that is on just the right orbit um, okay. to deflect it. To, yeah, it's, it's yeah. okay. Yeah. Too much science fiction. <laughs> By the way, I found a very interesting piece of information on the internet and you do not know which one I'm pulling up right now. Oh boy, there are multiple and Andrew Rifkins, so I'll also note that. So let me let me just try to find out if this is... The proper Andy Rifkin. Oh Just give me a second. Because my internet is not connected. Hold on. Till this loads up. Um, how, how did you end up in this world of planetary science, uh, ending up with DART? Um, where does that interest come from? What's your origin story? Oh, I was, um, uh, you know, born, born at the end of the 60s. And, uh, when I kind of, you know, was becoming uh, aware of the world ish, you know, at age five and six and seven, um, you know, right. I, I wanted to be a fireman and then I wanted to be an astronaut. Of course. And I, yeah. And I wanted to be an astronaut, but it was right around the time in between Apollo and before the space shuttle and there were no astronauts. And, um, but what there were was the Viking lander on Mars and Voyager and, so I got Carl Sagan. in space. Carl Sagan. Oh yeah, we watched, uh, you know, Cosmos when that was on public television in yeah, the US. Yeah, so did it was, I. It was amazing. Yeah, and uh, so I got into space. I knew I wanted to do planets again because of Viking and Voyagers, and and um, and uh, it just always stuck with me. Uh, I I had a little telescope. My grandparents were always very supportive. My grandmother used to bring me to the planetarium in New York City. Um, and, and the lights would go out and there would be all the, the stars on the ceiling and she would fall asleep instantly, but I would, you know, watch, uh, watch everything. Um, 
and when I went to college, um, I the the university I went to um, didn't have an astronomy department. They had a physics department and they had a uh, geology department that included planetary science. It was Earth, atmospheric, and planetary sciences. So, you know, kind of having to pick, I, I well, I'm going to go with the planetary mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. rather than the physics. Um, and uh, when I was uh, in graduate school, uh, I was at the University of Arizona. I knew, again, I loved going to the telescope. I loved, uh, you know, making observations. And um, there was so much about asteroids we didn't know. And there was so much about uh, everything else in the solar system that it felt like that we did know. You know, you, you didn't go to the telescope to study Mars. You, you know, worked on these, these missions that came by every once in a while. You know, if you're going to look at Neptune, okay, Voyager just went past, you, you do that. So um, asteroids really appealed to me and the idea that we knew so little and there was so, so much fundamental stuff about them. Um, and so um, I was in graduate school when um, planetary defense first kind of started to be something some people were taking seriously. Um, the uh, Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact into Jupiter, uh, Shoemaker-Levy 9 was discovered. The first year I was in graduate school, it impacted Jupiter, you know, a year or two later. Um, and um, the first searches for near-Earth objects were starting up again in Arizona and in, in, in California, JPL, around that time. So it was kind of still very low level and not a whole lot of folks were um, interested in it. Um, and uh, as an asteroid guy, you know, I, I was mostly doing the science, but I was aware of it. And then as it became um, taken more and more seriously, the impact into Siberia in, in 2013 and and, uh, and some other things, um, there was... That was a, that Tunguska. In oh, Tunguska was in 1908. Oh, ah, yeah, right. Before, before my time. Okay. There. Um, but in Chelyabinsk in 2013. Yes. And um, there, uh, you know, were only so many asteroid people and only so many asteroid people that, um, that uh, you know, had telescope experience. And, um, and uh, where I worked at the, where I still work at the Applied Physics Lab, um, they um, had some uh, involvement in some early planetary defense uh, efforts as well. So uh, it was just a kind of a, a thing that I kind of slid into. Sure. And it, and it looks cool as a business card you could leave on a table, <laughs> planetary defense. You know, it's, yeah, it's funny. When, um, if I'm on an airplane, you know, on a long <laughs> flight and sitting next to someone, uh, depending on my mood, right? If, if they say, well, you know, so what do you strike do? Up a con yeah, strike up a conversation. And if I, if I feel like, okay, look, I'm, I'm exhausted. I just want to sleep. You know, then I, oh, well, you know, I study the, the um, aqueous alteration reactions in, <laughs> in low albedo asteroids because we're really interested in understanding the distribution right. of hydrogen minerals, right? If I do okay, want to talk, you. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's great. If, if I do want to talk, uh, then it's, oh, I, I, you know, look at planetary defense and think about deflecting asteroids. And then, good, yeah. off you go. Yeah. Wonderful. So, um, Andy, you may not be prepared for this, but oh, I yeah. found something on the internet uh, that could be of interest. And I'm trying to find out if this is the the proper Andy Rifkin. Um, oh, yeah. Is, oh, yeah. is this yeah, you? That's, that's me. That's me. So, yeah, I can't sing. <laughs> All right, you need to you need to explain what's going on here. Uh, yeah, well, I've always I've always liked music. You know, I think it's uh, important. Here's my my random piece of of uh, advice to anyone out there who's who might find it useful. Uh, you know, if you have hobbies, keep keep your hobbies. They'll keep you sane. Um, so I always liked music. I was a drummer in. Um, a drummer in uh, in high school, in junior high school, and then picked up some guitar in college and played in bands, just kind of having you fun. You still play? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've got a, a band camp uh, site mm. uh, where, I, where I post some music. But it's all, you know, me and my laptop and guitar and synthesizer so for fun. where can people find you? 
uh andy rifkin.bandcamp.com and i think my music is on apple music wow and i had been uh, i had been on spotify but when uh you know neil neil young and joni mitchell pulled their stuff i <laughs> pulled mine in solidarity of course um but um of course it's all about space it's not all, all about, about space <laughs> there's, there's some there's okay. some about space uh, like like the one you played there. Uh, there is a dart song. The dart song is on YouTube, so you can get my music on YouTube. Good. Um, so can and, we can we play it in the in the podcast then? So you would like legally, you you're giving me the rights right now <laughs> to to play it in the, as an excerpt in the podcast just to show. Oh yeah 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 okay. yeah yeah. Um, the dart song is better than you know the, this one. We didn't start the science. Good. Yeah. Uh, we didn't start the science was, was again, kind of, kind of, uh, goofy and fun. Um, but I was in a band in grad school and we used to, we used to play and, uh, and, um, you know, the dark song was, uh, the, uh, the, um, program, uh, program manager was like, oh, Hey, you, you were write us a song, write a song for right. dart. And I was like, again, going back to what we said, I was like, all right, until this is like confirmed, mm -hmm. You know, once NASA says, yeah, okay, we're going to, we're going to do this. That's when I'll write mm. the song. I'm not going to write it, you know, mm. four years ahead of time. But, um, and, uh, wrote a sequel actually mm. just, uh, put that out on, on the internet, uh, a few weeks ago. So, so is it, is it on YouTube? Um, yeah. Where do they find the it? The song, search on, so the, uh, the, the artist's name is Andy Rifkin and, uh, his Gedanken band. Gedanken band. The Gedanken band. So if you're familiar with uh, German, and I know you of are. Of course. Um, a Gedanken experiment is, uh, in physics, it's a thought experiment. So the Gedanken band is is uh, a band that, that does not exist, and it's just me. Good, good. Hey, um, let's pull it up. Uh, the Dart song, uh, there is a video, yeah, or is the video. Dart song song? Okay, let's check it out. That's the right one. Yeah, this is the right one. But don't go thinking that they're all the same. There's 20 zillion rocks out there around. All right. So this was officially commissioned by your boss. I suppose. <laughs> like officially commissioned. I mean, I didn't get paid anything for it. <laughs> but yeah. it was a request. It was a request uh, for me to write one. Yeah. What does all this mean in when it comes to communicating science? Is it this is a fun project for you, or is there more? Is there a, a vision behind all this? Behind the music, not only behind the music, but b behind you doing it. Ah, uh, um, I um, it's a fun hobby for me. Yeah, and um, actually, I I feel like um. The times that I have been uh, performing on an open mic night, or we have a we have uh, open mic nights at at some of our professional society meetings, kind of talent show things, um, and then yeah, being in bands over the years. So I feel like right open yeah. door, open night open mic night yeah yeah being in bands over the years I think has helped um, certainly in terms of giving talks in terms of feeling like I can. I can improvise, like I can get up and and not be afraid mm. of, of an audience. Um, but um, I feel like it's, to the extent that there's a, a strategy, I guess I just feel like it's important for um, people to be themselves. And, you know, scientists, there's, there's certainly plenty of stereotypes about what scientists yeah. are like. And to show that, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a whole person. I'm not, yeah. science isn't my whole. Yeah. It's a part of my life, but so is the music and yeah. so is the other stuff. So, yeah. uh, and I'm, I'm in a privileged enough position. I know not everyone is in this kind of position to be able to share these different parts of, mm. of who I am. How do you feel about the public um, reception of science these days? It seems like um, science is under, under attack from different, different angles. What is, what is going on these days? Um, and what can we do about it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is, um, certainly something that, uh, is an, an entirely anecdotal, you know, not a, not a thing I have studied. I know people have studied it. I know people have looked at, at what data is out there, mm. what people really think. Sure. Uh, so just from, from how it feels, um, you know, uh, science is, 
uh, I guess arguably science has always been um, seen as as uh, you know something that can help. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure sure. out how to put it correctly. Um, science can be used for the common good. Science can be used for uh, specific agendas. Um, and that's been true as long as there has been, you know, has been science, um, right? The, my, my, if I have my history right, you know, telescopes were developed for, you know, military purposes back in the early 1600s. And in fact, I, I think we don't know who the inventor of the, the telescope mm. is because, you know, there's some evidence that, that, you know, different, you know, different navies had developed it and just mm -hmm. kept it secret. Um, so it wasn't Galileo. Galileo did not invent the telescope. No, I think we know that he did yeah. not invent it, but he, just, uh, he um, was the first one to use it for, yeah, yeah, right. you know, for, for yeah. science for, well, yeah, for, for uh, astronomy, um, or at least the first one to popularize themselves doing it for astronomy. Um, there's a story, um, you know, the, the, the big Chicxulub impact crater mm -hmm. in, in Mexico, uh, which has been associated with the, the, the KT impactor and the, the, and the demise of the dinosaurs. Um, that was discovered by, uh, an oil company, a Mexican oil company, um, who were surveying the area and they kept it secret for mm. years and years because it was, you know, they mapped it as part of their, you know, oil exploration mm. strategy. And, you know, they, they said, okay, yeah, this is a crater, but. Well, why would they keep it a, a, a secret? But, um, my understanding, and again, this is anecdotal and, and et cetera. Uh, was that it was, you know, something they, they mapped, uh, using their company resources that was designed to help them find more, uh, you know, oil to, to extract. And it was a proprietary document that gave them a competitive advantage mm. and they, you know, mm. didn't, uh, it, it took a while. They might not have quite recognized what, um, what the what the um, importance of this mm -hmm. kind of weird circular structure was, uh, but it was something that they just didn't, mm. didn't make public. Interesting. Um, so um, the uh, the interpretation of science, the way science is presented to the public, um, I think similarly, you know, there are there have been countries throughout history that have um, either um that have that have politicized science um you know even even you know throughout the 20th century mm -hmm. during the cold war during world war ii uh some some countries treated science as a thing that uh you know had to be in the in the service of national of ideologies yeah, yeah in ideologies of yeah. Course, yeah um and and some that didn't and um so uh, we, that, that continues. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, I think it's important as scientists to, um, you know, scientists are citizens of, of our, uh, certainly residents of, of places, whether or not we're always citizens of the places where we're, where we reside. Um, and I, I think it's important, uh, as much as we can to make sure that the science is serving the public good. Um, there, there are, uh, in some cases, there are legitimate um, disagreements we can have about interpretations, but in, in a lot of cases, there aren't. And, um, you know, if, if I'm talking around the problem, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, it's a uh, tricky subject. It is. Yeah. It is. So I think this is a very interesting age we're in when it comes to the exploration of space, the space industry. So we're, it's, it's a new age of discovery that's looming on the horizon, maybe we're all, we're already in the middle of, of it. Where do you think from your perspective that we are headed in the next decades? Is, is this a moment where humanity after its first steps towards venturing out into the, into the void that now we're growing up, that we're getting ever more sophisticated towards becoming an interplanetary species, or is that too early still? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, one of the things that I think is, is, uh, always interesting, you know, that Arthur C. Clarke yeah. is, uh, credited with, um, inventing the, the idea of a communication satellite. At least I think it was Arthur C. Clarke. Um, and 
he recognized that you know you put things out at geosynchronous orbit and they could you know say and 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 communicate with the with with the, the whole planet um but he imagined that there would be astronauts up there at switchboards because the computers you know hadn't been developed yet or the computers that had been developed at that point were nowhere near capable uh like they are now so on the one hand um i i can imagine various uh, various things and that, that I'm now gonna gonna spew about, I guess. Uh, but the technology has is gonna move in ways, you know, in the next 10, 15, 20 years that that mm. might make all of this, you know, irrelevant. Um, I think um, whether and how humanity moves out into the solar system, um, you know, clearly we need to do stuff here on Earth to make sure that Earth. Um, has a future has a future remains habitable i think earth will have a future oh but yeah. humanity may not yeah sure sure yeah. sure yeah the, to to see that that uh it, it remains habitable to to us yeah um and um i think the the idea of well we'll just go out to mars we'll do whatever it is um does not serve humanity well you know it might serve a very small sliver uh to imagine themselves as the you know noah's ark going out and and to a new planet and and you know saving the species that way but that's probably not going to be uh much uh solace to the, to mm. the billions who don't get to go um so we we kind of need to to make sure that that the earth stays a place you know uh, whether whether or not you see it as the cradle of humankind or you know, the, the forever home, um, of humankind. Uh, I think that, um, as computers get more, um, again, get more, more capable, um, our idea of what exploration is for, um, I think changes. Um, there were a lot of things that only people talk about, okay, only astronauts can do this mm. or that. Mm. And that list of things is getting shorter mm. and only, you know, in circa 1969, 1970, the only way to bring back a, a, a lot of samples from the moon was to send people. But it didn't take very long mm. for the Russians to send for the Soviets, I'm sorry, uh, for the Soviet Union to to do a sample return from the moon. Uh, it, it didn't bring back nearly as much material, but it was a, you know, proof, proof of concept. concept yeah. Um, so the question of why and how we send people, um, I think, um, is something that, that, uh, you know, needs, needs, uh, an answer, mm. uh, needs an answer to be continually revisited. Mm. Um, and that does not mean there is no answer. It doesn't mm. mean there is no good reason. Certainly there are, there are mm. good reasons. Um, but I think, um, a lot of the, a lot of the rationales are maybe, kind of kind of held mm. over mm. Mm. um so what, yeah what do you make of chat gpt these days <laughs> um i i have not uh i i played with it once or twice uh but other than that i think it's it, it's uh something i've just kind of seen other people react to mm. um it is I, I think like a lot of technologies it's it's a tool and the tool is going to be used in Lots of ways that were never conceived of, mm. and some of those could be really uh, beneficial, and some of those could be really, <laughs> you know, harmful. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to the extent that it could be a time saver, you know, uh, of you know, great. Okay, I need to to write some. I need to file some some standard report every month mm. and i just need to change you know here's here's the words you know i'm just going to talk at talk at the dictation device and it's going to extract from that what needs to go mm. into the report sure you know to the extent that it's i'm gonna get into medical school mm. by you know uh you know or i'm gonna i'm gonna pass some some important you know i'm gonna pass the bar based mm. on you know something like that that's that's mm. not so good mm. um so, you know, the idea of putting AI into positions of um, making decisions, making important decisions, uh, I think is something that we really need to understand 
mm. you know, I, I would, I don't want to say that it's, it's always going to be terrible. I think it probably always will be terrible, but, um, knowing all of the ways in which AI can be the ways in which AI learns the ways in which, you know, a bot gets released onto the social media mm. and it becomes, mm. you know, a racist piece mm. of trash very quickly. Uh, I think, um, I think we need to think hard about the ways in which we're using mm. it. Mm. If the call came, um, would you be ready to board maybe the second starship and go into space? Um, uh, go up into space and, and come back, you know, um, go into sp maybe like, a couple of months later, a couple of months. No, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm not even sure I would commit to going to Antarctica for a couple months. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I, I mean, I think that's another, that maybe you're, you're heading in this direction. Maybe you're not, uh, you know, how, how does space travel get democratized? Will space travel ever be democratized? You know, my, again, my, my imperfect historical understanding is that, uh, you know, in the, in the early times of air travel that people would, you know, you could build your own air aircraft and uh, maybe you could trust it. Maybe you couldn't, but you know, and then you'd go to county fairs maybe, and maybe for a lot of people, at least in North America, um, you know, their first flight was you went to the, the state fair and some mm -hmm. guy had a had an airplane and you paid five dollars and you went up for 10 minutes and you came back down and i think people are imagining space travel is going to be like that and i don't think there's ever going to be you know you go to your oktoberfest <laughs> uh you know and there's there's your little rocket and you pay yeah. 20 dollars and you go up for yeah. 10 minutes or yeah. 15 or whatever yeah. and come back down um That'd be fun it would be fun but i i that seems really, um, in terms of, of uh, the resources that you'd need and in terms really of the infrastructure yeah. and, and all of that. Um, and so I, I don't know if there's ever going to be, I think it's going to take a long time before there are, you know, 100,000 mm -hmm. people that have been in space. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, looking at the, the possible... Um, or at least the near-ish term um, destinations for people in space. You know, there's the moon, and then there's Mars, and Mars is kind of a stretch, um, at least right now. And beyond Mars, it gets really, really hard to figure out... Venus, they say. Uh, yeah, but stay in, stay in the clouds. Yeah, yeah stay, in, stay the in the clouds. Yeah. Um, but, you know... Uh, some of these things, I, I admit I've only gotten through, you know, the first kind of season of The Expanse, and I know there's a lot more, <laughs> but, um, you know, a future where, where there, are, there, there are human bases, you know, in the Galilean satellites mm. or, or anywhere past, you know, even Ceres. I can, I can imagine Ceres, but I, I think we're talking a very, very mm. long time mm. before people mm. really, before a significant mm. number of people Mm. Um, even a self um, sustaining number mm. of people Could. are living anywhere mm. but Earth. Um, I set up a playlist um, on Spotify for the aspiring space traveler. <laughs> and now I'm asking you, because this is a, uh, this is a question I'm asking all my guests okay. to contribute one tune they wouldn't want to miss on that long haul. What tune would you not want to miss? Uh, these are... Any any songs? Any or any, any doesn't need to be space related. Yeah yeah. So I'm a I'm a Beatles fan. I'm a big Beatles fan. Um, and uh, of course the and Abbey Road is my very favorite album. Okay, we're narrowing it down. Yeah yeah. The problem uh, I don't know how familiar you are. Right. I mean I I feel like bit. of course everyone's f yeah. familiar with the Beatles. Like no, they are at least. Um, that album has a lot of uh kind of the the side two, uh back in the day side two. Um, is composed of these kind of five to ten minute songs that are formally cut up into these two minute pieces. So if if you're deciding that you know, okay, look, this you know, Polythene Pam is all by itself. It's a it's a minute and a half long. It wouldn't be that, but you know, kind of the the side two of Abbey Road or the the you know, uh, Golden Slumbers carry that weight. At the end that that might mm -hmm. be the one. If if uh, 
if one is going to be strict about it, then I would flip the Abbey Road over and go for the last, the last song. I want you. I want you. She's so heavy. That would be good. Fun. Good. Um, we ran out of coffee, but this um, show is called the Space Cafe Podcast. Oh. It's a coffee place. Um, and you already mentioned um, that you're having coffee to energize yourself, uh, to stay awake. Now, why don't you share an espresso for the mind with me, with the audience, uh, <laughs> an idea that you think could be inspiring, could be energizing to audiences. You can pick whatever kind of topic you want to pick. Um, yeah, I think that um, by and large, um, you know, I think, I think people, people are good. I think, you know, almost every interaction I've had with people who I'm meeting for the first time, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a, in a taxi, you know, halfway around the world. I'm, I'm in a, in a restaurant, you know, somewhere I don't speak the language. Um, you know, people are, are basically the same. People want the same things. People want, uh, you know, want to be happy. People want their family to be happy. People want to, to be put in a position where they can thrive. Um, and I think that, um, that by and large, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll find a way. I think humanity is, has a lot of goodwill for each other. And, um, I think it's a matter of, of tapping into that and remembering that we're all one, we're all in this together. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that we should go, go into space and explore, uh, uh, you know, the universe, um, and that it's going to be most meaningful, uh, if, and when we do it together. Wonderful. Andy Rifkin, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you had as much fun as I had recording that show. We have one more to come in our Planetary Defense miniseries. Planetary scientist Naomi Murdoch will join me next time in the studio. And until then, my friends, don't forget to rate this show on your favorite podcatcher. And please, leave as many reviews as you can. This is the only language the damn machines understand to push us even further up to the tops of science podcasts. And now in all its glory, let's listen to the dart song one more time. From the beginning to the end, goodbye everyone, and thanks for listening. Take care. There's 20 zillion rocks out there around us. But don't go thinking that they're all the same. There's 20 zillion rocks out there around us. But on some of those rocks you'll find our name We've been pelted all throughout our timeline The solar system's playing dirty pool We've been pelted all throughout our timeline Go ask the dinosaurs if that was cool if we could evade, our day would be made Something to strafe could keep us all safe And doing a test would really be best To avoid those problems So we're testing NEO deflection And doing it for practice just seems smart It's trying out orbital correction goes by the name of Dart that double asteroid redirection test and just one flick should do the trick just one nudge and those things would budge a little poke not going for broke would avoid those problems Dart will visit the Didymos system a one way trip that won't be a fluke so when hazards come, we can resist them Without resorting to a giant nuke And just one flick should do the trick Just one nudge and those things would budge 
A little poke not going for broke Would avoid those problems Cause it could get worse if we don't rehearse We'll run aground and see what we found First we detect, then we deflect Practice planetary defense with DART 